Hello, today is September 30th, 2011. We're meeting today with Mr. Bruce Seller at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Bruce, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Thank you. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little, bit about, a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. I was born June 8th, 1931, in Vancouver, Washington. Um, I grew up in a little town just north of Vancouver called Battleground, Washington. It's a town of maybe 500 people. Um, I graduated from high school in 1949. Uh, I was interested in sports. Uh, my dad was our high school principal. Um, so um, that was pretty much, uh, I, um, you know, like most kids um, that age, I worked uh, as I had to. I had a paper route for seven or eight years. It was 10 miles long. I did my own collecting and got my own customers. Of course, this was during World War II, so um, that's how things were in those years. Well, we'll talk about that period of time uh, on the home front as far as uh, what life was like as far as rationing and, 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 the, and the like. We had gas rationing. Uh, actually, the food rationing didn't bother us too much because we lived on 40 acres and then we uh, moved to five acres, but we grew a lot of our own food, uh, had our own cow. And, had some chickens and a few hogs, and so we really, we, we ate fairly well. Uh, there was, uh, since we were growing up in the Pacific Northwest, west of the Cascade Mountains, there was a great deal of fear early on about what the Japanese might do. I can remember as a fifth and sixth grader uh, taking part in some air raid drills. Uh, we had a, a FFA chapter and they had a 40 acre farm and on that farm they had a five, about a five acre grove of trees and they used to march us out there and we'd get down on our faces and cover the back of our heads. And we did that after about uh, oh, 1943 when it was evident that we weren't going to be attacked by the Japanese why they kind of backed off from that. But that was, kind of the, that was kind of the country that I grew up in. Now, did you have any brothers and sisters? Yes, I had one younger brother who's two years younger than I, a sister who is uh, eight years younger than I. Okay. Yeah, I was the oldest, oldest. Of, okay. of the three. So you, you graduated from high school in 1949. Yes. Uh, what did you do after uh, graduation? Well, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, so I was looking around for something. And I came across something that the Marine Corps put out. They had that uh, you could enlist for one year on active duty, and at the end of that one year, you had two options. You could take either four years in the active reserves or six years in the inactive reserves, and you didn't have to make up your mind until the end of, the, of your one-year tour. So I enlisted June 28, 1949. Now, uh, out of all the services, why the Marines? Did the Marines stick out or just that program? Because that program. Okay. Okay. That program. All right. And I think that was probably one of the smarter things I did <laughs> after all was said and done. Yeah. <laughs> so how soon then after you uh, enlisted did you uh, ship off for, for your base? Well, I enlisted on in the morning of June the 28th. They loaded us on a train the afternoon of June the 28th. Really? <laughs> yeah. And I was with two other guys. Uh, buddies or? Uh, no. Uh, no. Well, one of them, uh, we got to talking as we went down. And it turned out that he and I had faced each other across the line of scrimmage our junior year in high school in a football game. <laughs> so we got to be pretty good friends, and we still are. He's okay. still living, and we still communicate with the, each other. But we, we, they loaded us on a train, and we got down to Recruit Depot in San Diego on June the 29th. Did that give you enough to get time to get everything in order? Uh, well, I mean, did you didn't expect, have much choice. Did you, did you expect to leave that soon? I mean. Uh, yeah, they, oh, they, okay. they told me, so oh, okay. it, wasn't, it wasn't a surprise. All right. And um, and your folks had no problem with you joining no, the service? No, okay. they didn't. Okay. Uh, my dad pretty much, uh, you know, you do what you feel you need to do, and uh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So we got down to boot camp, and boot camp at that time was 10 weeks long, except the Marine Corps wanted to uh, have a little competition between the recruit platoons. So they kept us down there for three weeks without putting us on a schedule. 
until we got three platoons. Then we went on the 10-week schedule. So actually, I was in boot camp for probably um, 13 weeks. And how was that transition going from civilian life uh, to military life? It was, it was hard. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just wasn't used to the discipline. Not that I wasn't disciplined. Our dad was a firm believer in that, but I, not anything like the Marine Corps. <laughs> so, but at any rate, um, <clears throat> we got through it just fine. And uh, after I came back from boot leave, my first assignment was at the Puget Sound Navy Shipyard in, in Bremerton, Washington. They had an, a Navy base there. Actually, they had part of the World War II Pacific Fleet mothballed there. They did have a Navy base there, and we were on gate. I was on a gate guard. And I did that until I was released on uh, June the 27th, 1950. Now, that timing of that was really interesting because on June the 25th, 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea. Right, right. Now, at that point, we weren't sure what our reaction was going to be. So I had selected the inactive reserves. The friend that I played football with selected the active reserves. And he was uh, recalled, I think it was in the second week of July. I remember we were down at the end of June. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the word was out that we would be recalled the inactive reserves, but they didn't know when. So I spent the summer, I worked as a mail hand in a paper mill. I decided I wanted to go to college, play football, and become a teacher. So I went to Central Washington College. Two a days football practice started the first of September. I went through three weeks of two a days. I didn't get to play in the first game, which was fortunate because it could have cost me years of eligibility. Because the next Monday, after I'd stood in line and paid my fees to get to school, my mother called me and said, "You got your recall." <laughs> so, uh, I was to report for my physical on October the, I think it was October the 12th, in 1950. And we were told if you pass the physical, you're going to go right from there to Camp Pendleton. So we did. Camp Pendleton was a zoo because of all of the people they were recalling. We were probably two weeks before we got any uniforms even. And I can remember in the chow hall there, I think in two weeks outside of three meals, every meal we had was beef stew, including breakfast. I never really have been a fan of beef stew since, since then. But about the 1st of November, they finally put us on a training schedule. Now, you know, in looking at the news, it looked like we probably were going to get by without having to go because MacArthur had landed at, at Incheon and they had broken the North Korean. I mean, the North Koreans were taking off. And so we thought, well, you know, we may be in six months or so, and then we go back home. Thanksgiving, we started to get some pretty bad news. Uh, it, the rumor was that the Chinese had come in, and that rumor was confirmed in the next couple of days, and they trapped the 1st Marine Division in a reservoir up in North, North Korea, the Chosen Reservoir. Of course, that was uh, not good news. We were training at some point in the first week in December, and I don't remember the exact date. We were all confined to barracks, and the word was that we were going to be shipped to Korea as infantry replacements. So that's what we were, we were infantry. Um, on December the 10th or 11th, we, those of us who were in for either about 300 of us, as I remember, were loaded on board a train at Camp Pendleton and shipped up to a Navy base in uh, San Francisco. And I don't remember the name of the base. Um, they were getting planes. They uh, took some um, uh, passenger planes and loaded people on them. Uh, they loaded uh, 12 or 13 of us. Uh, on board an old cargo plane. It was an R5D or a C46 or C47. There was a load of supplies tied down in the, in the middle of the, of the uh, 
plane. We sat in bucket seats around the edges. There were 12 or 13 of us. We had three sergeants in charge of us. And just uh, uh, only one of the three sergeants made it back. Um, we took off about 10.30 at night, landed in Honolulu for breakfast, um, went from Honolulu to um, Johnson Island, from Johnson Island to Kwajalein Island, from Kwajalein Island to Guam. We got to Guam about 10 o'clock at night and they unloaded us there and put us in a Quonset hut for the night. And I can remember, of course, they had a night bite on and I'm lying there on a cot looking up. And my gosh, the bugs that were, the big bugs crawling around on the scene of that Quonset hut were really something. <laughs> but the next morning they loaded us on board again and we took us from Guam to uh, Okinawa. And from Okinawa, then they flew us into Tokyo. And I think we got in there, it was after dark, and I probably about 10 o'clock, and it was raining. The last hour to that flight was not any fun. But they took us by bus to, I believe it was the Navy base at Yakuska, which is a suburb of Tokyo. And they were getting people there, those who had been wounded earlier, and. Uh, just getting people ready to go. We stayed there maybe four days and were like it's maybe the 18th or 19th of December. Then they loaded us on a Japanese train and sent us south. I think we wound up in Sasebo, but I can remember very plainly. Night, um, I woke up about midnight and happened to look out and we were stopped. And there was a sign there, the Japanese, I couldn't read, underneath it said Hiroshima, which is where the first A-bomb was drawn. And of course I couldn't see anything because it was midnight. But I thought, geez, you know, uh, that's really something. Oh, <laughs> that. And, and uh, along that train ride when it was still light and you could see it, was there still, was there much damage left from the war or was it We, pretty... didn't, we didn't see much okay. of that. Okay. We got down to Sasebo and right away they loaded us on board an old Japanese Maru. And, um, was one of the few, I guess, left over from World War II. There were no bunks or anything, and they just we were just down in the hold. And I'll never forget, there were uh, a dozen or two dozen Turkish soldiers there who had been wounded and who were being sent back. Now, they didn't speak English and we didn't speak Turkish, so there wasn't much interplay. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember, the trip took two or three days. Uh, we were landed us at Pusan on the evening of December the 24th, if you were there, December the 23rd, if you were here, because they're a day ahead mm -hmm, of us, mm -hmm. which would be Christmas Eve there. They unloaded us off the Maru and Pusan and loaded us on an, L an LST. Now they loaded us alphabetically, and by the time they got down to the W's, they had no more bunks left. So they said, well, you go down into the hold. So we went down into the hold. It's fine, except it was jammed full of tanks. And so a friend and I unrolled our sleeping bags underneath the tank and spent Christmas Eve underneath the tank. That must have been tough. Oh, it was not fun. And both physically and emotionally. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we, we did what we had to do. And the next morning, which there was Christmas Day, here would be Christmas Eve morning, we, they landed us at Mawson and unloaded us. and. They fell us into three ranks, and one rank went to the 1st Marine Regiment, another rank went to the 5th Marine Regiment, third rank went to the 7th Marine Regiment. I was the one that went to the 5th Marine Regiment. And so they marched us down to the 5th Marine Regiment, fell us in three ranks. First rank went to the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, second rank, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, third rank, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. I was in the first rank, so it's 1st Battalion. So they marched us again down there and then fell us into three lines. First line went to A Company, second line B Company, third line C Company. I was in C Company. So I was C Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. And then they marched us to the... Uh, now they had them back in reserve their way south because the casualties had been horrendous and the guys were just really wiped out. Uh, they had gotten down there from the reservoir about the 15th of December, and we were there the 24th or 25th of December. So we were. So they had just gotten run, had just run the gauntlet. And yeah, yeah. And 
I, you know, I was, as a kid, well, 19, I was still a kid. I'd been pretty excited about seeing all those places, you know. So we had the first roll call when we got there. And then it hit me because there were only about 60 guys who were out for roll call. And a Marine company in those years ran between 230 and 235 men. And at that point, I began to understand what I was in for. Oh, geez. So um, they, they started training. Some, and I have to hand it to the guys who survived. They wouldn't talk about what they'd been through, and it's just as well. They didn't want to scare us. And I'm just really glad they did because later on, we didn't do the same thing with replacements that we got. So they started the training. And again, about the third week in January, when MacArthur had landed at Incheon and the North Korean army in the south broke and, and ran north, some of the North Korean infantry took to the hills and they began raiding farmers and small villages. And in fact, I think they, they had one group that was even larger enough, they stopped to train to get food and supplies from them. So we got our training chasing those people uh, in southwestern Korea, southeastern Korea. Um, we got shot at, uh, we did some shooting back. Uh, we learned about digging foxholes, about all of that. And we actually were in that uh, two and a half or three weeks, four weeks. Again, I, I don't remember yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. About the 19th, 18th or 19th of December, or uh, February, uh, MacArthur had started a, uh, an offensive designed to drive the North Koreans back across the border. And so they got the 1st Marine Division up. And, I think it was along about February the 21st, we actually jumped off on, on the front lines. And the next four months, we were just in and out of the front line, mostly on the front lines. But um, it was uh, quite an experience. Now I can go into some of the details there, what it was like to be a, an infantryman. Yeah, please. In the Marine Corps. Now I would suspect that what I have to say, most people who are in infantry, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, had maybe not exactly the same thing, but at least similar experiences. Um, I was in a light machine gun crew. I was uh, an ammo carrier, and during the cold weather, we were carrying between 90 and 100 pounds of gear. We Each ammo carrier carried two cans of ammunition. Each can weighed 16 pounds. We had straps and we just slung them to our shoulders. We carried a uh, carbine, uh, ammo for that, uh, cold weather supplies, uh, probably two or three days rations, entrenching tool, you know, the, the works. And we were, we were not on level ground or in the valleys or on the roads, we were up in the hills. And whenever we would come down off a ridge line, we would immediately climb the next ridge line. The further north we went, the higher the, the hills got. And so we were really, uh, you know, that was really, that was part of it, part of it. Uh, second thing was food, the sea rations. Um, if you could heat them up, they weren't too bad. But unfortunately, uh, that time of the year was spring coming and the winter thawing, the wood was wet and you started a fire and it smoked. And I can remember we had a North Korean or Chinese forward observation team zero in some artillery on our fire one morning. So oh, no fires. So we had to eat the food cold. Sea rations cold were <laughs> really good. So we seemed like we were hungry all the time. Uh, when spring came in March, they'd had a cold winter and the thaw came and the rains came and we didn't have any surfaced roads over in the area we were where we were. So it was really difficult to ship uh, material up to us and they had a, a first was ammunition, second was water, third was food. I can remember several times our uh, platoon uh, uh, officer tossing his food 
a, a box of sea rations saying, guys, I know this is one day's food, but I don't know when we'll get the next, so make it last. So there are times when that one box of food had to go was three days. Uh, one of the guys said, well, <laughs> he said, I hate to say this to you guys, but you know, if you smoked, you wouldn't be quite so hungry. So there were some of us started smoking and it did, it did ease our hunger. But we were really, we were really pretty hungry. Um, one of the things we had to do, uh, we had to dig foxholes every night. Uh, we had a two-man fox, well, a big foxhole for our machine gun. Then we had to dig our fighting holes. And then we usually tried to scrape something out on the reverse slope. We were always on the slope of the hill. And our, our um, fighting positions were on the front slope. Our uh, sleeping positions were on the rear slope. But, you know, the first six weeks, we had maybe four to six inches of frost or frozen in the ground. Our entrenching tools wouldn't do. Fortunately, somebody in our uh, uh, section, had, machine gun section, had an ax. And we took, used that ax to cut down through the first four to six inches, and then we're able to dig our foxholes. If you're a rifleman, you stood two hours on and two hours off watch. Machine gun crews, we stood two hours on and four hours off. Now you combine that with the climbing up and down hills all day, with the poor food, uh, and with that, and we were really, it seemed like we were tired all the time. Well, let me ask you, uh, uh, just examining what you just told me, you, you weren't eating properly, you weren't getting enough sleep, you were out in the elements, uh, obviously hygiene probably wasn't the best, <laughs> Any, 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 any one of those yeah. alone would, would, would take a man down, yes. but you've got those combined, coupled with the umbrella and stress of war. Yeah. How do you think you made it through that period well, of time? Well, they would pull us off the lines every four or five days for a couple of days. And uh, our watches would be cut in half. Occasionally we might get hot food, but we were back where we could start a fire to heat our food. Um, you just toughed it out. What choice did you have? Uh, the Chinese and Koreans would fight mostly at night, and we fought mostly at the day. Now, we were pretty fortunate in my unit. We didn't get too many night attacks. We got some probing attacks, but most of our fighting was us attacking them. But we still had to stand watch at night. Um, we went about four months that way. And finally, we got into a couple of really nasty fights at the end of, uh, of uh, May and the 1st of June. And we, our casualties were pretty heavy. Uh, we lost three guys from machine gun section. I went from an ammo carrier to combination squad leader and gunner for until we could get some more men and when I became a squad leader. Um, and I can remember we started up one hill and the trail zigzagged like this. And we knew there were Chinese or Koreans at the top because we'd been shot at and other units had been shot at by them. Well, somebody at the head of the line had kicked loose some large boulders or rock and I turned around to yell at the guys in my squad to watch out. I turned back this way and the next thing I remember, I'm lying flat on my back with my head downhill and my, the weight of my pack and everything up around my neck and shoulders. And I, for a few seconds, I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know whether I'd been hit with an artillery shell, or whether it was a rock. Finally, after a few seconds, I, it was a rock that hit me. A couple of riflemen came down and pulled me up and I took a deep breath and I thought I was, felt like somebody ran a hot iron through my chest. But I wasn't bleeding, so I didn't go to, to um, a corpsman or anything. And we got up the top of the hill and turned to the right, and we uh, took a lot more casualties. I don't want to go into that any, Fair enough. any more yeah. than that. But I went for six weeks. Every time I took a deep breath of something, felt like I was just running a hot iron through my chest. Uh, but again, like I said, I wasn't bleeding. We had a lot of casualties. We finally had so many casualties, 
in the 5th Marine Regiment that they pulled, well, they pulled the whole division clear off the lines and put us back about 20 miles in the rear. And we were there for probably two months. They shipped in new troops and we went through a training. It was like when I first mm -hmm. got there. Mm -hmm. We didn't say anything about the experiences we had. We just simply focused on what they had to learn. Now, you spoke about hygiene. Uh, I can remember we went one time about six weeks without a shower. Uh, very seldom did we get a shower more than every two or three weeks or more. Um, by the time they pulled us off, I remember my dungarees, I had big tears in both legs. My boots, I had a hole in the sole of one boot. The other boot, the uh, sole had come detached at the, at the toe from the, from the rest of the uh, shoe and was just kind of flapping around like this. So when they pulled us back, they sent us in to get uh, fresh clothing and stuff. Now it wasn't new, it was, and I can remember the supply sergeant said, well, what size trousers did you take? And I said, well, 36. He looked at me and said, the biggest size I got is size 30. And I said, oh, I don't. He said, try it on. It fit me just fine. I lost six inches Jeez. in the four months. And that gives you an example of what it was that we, uh, that we had to go through. Um, we spent, again, probably two months training them and in the rear, um, I can remember a time actually before we got into the rear when we were backing up a North Korean Marine Regiment, they were assaulting a big hill mass out in front of us. And they had us dug in right behind them in case the Chinese or Koreans tried to flank them. And I can remember sitting in foxhole and artillery going both ways, out going high, incoming, parting my hair. Jeez. And I'm down in the foxhole just praying that I'd live to see tomorrow because that day I was 19, tomorrow I'd be 20. And I wanted to know what it would be like to be, not to be a teenager anymore. Well, I survived, but we had five or six casualties that day from the artillery. Well, then they pulled us off and, and we spent a couple weeks in, or a couple months in reserve. And then they committed us again, but since we'd done a lot of the heavy fighting the last uh, of May and June, they committed the, the 1st Marine Regiment and the 7th Marine Regiment for us. And their casualties were horrendous. In three days, I think they had 1,500 casualties. Now that's what we heard, I can't prove that. But then our turn was coming next, so we were marching up to, well, marching, we were marching, we were walking up to the uh, front line, and we got up there and spread out on this hill. I remember looking across the deep valley, and there was another hill there, and of course the ridge line was higher than ours by probably almost 200 meters. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I'd just be darn lucky if I survive the next. And uh, so we sat there a day or two, and finally the word came down saying, dig in, or we're not going any further. And that's still part of the DMZ now. <laughs> And we were about all we had. We did send out patrols, but they didn't send machine guns out on the patrols. Uh, we did have a few probing attacks at night. I had a good friend who was invited to go to China by three Chinese infantrymen. And uh, he fought them off. In fact, he got one of their Burt guns, which he smuggled back in, into this country. <laughs> but. Um, you know, it was just that way until we, uh, I guess we left finally the next to the last or the last day in November. They uh, um, <clears throat> pulled us off, those of us who were due for, for um, what do you want to call it, um, replacement. Uh, they, they were trying to put each person in for a year. And we had left the continental limits of the United States about the middle of December in 1950. And word came down that anybody who wasn't in the continental limits of the United States in 1950 uh, would be back home in 1951. So I actually had to serve only a few days over 11 months in Korea instead of the, the full year. But um, they loaded us on board. I don't remember whether it was a troop ship or not took us back to Kyoto, 
and there was a marine base outside Kyoto and they left us there for eight days and uh, they gave us liberty from noon uh, until midnight, six of the eight days. And then they took us to, I'm not sure what town it was, Osaka, I think, and shipped us out of Osaka on the USS John Pope. And uh, it took about 11 days for us to get back to this country. And I think probably the most awe-inspiring thing that I saw in the year that I was outside of this country was coming back underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, and you've probably heard that before. But we came back in in the morning, about 8 o'clock in the morning, and boy, I tell you, there's some guys actually got down and kissed the deck of the ship. They were so glad to be there. But you know, it wasn't like World War II. They got in and landed us, and there were maybe a dozen people on the, on the dock welcoming us. But it so happened that four of them were my aunts and uncles. Is that right? Two aunts and two uncles. One of my uncles was an FBI agent in San Francisco, and they kept the timing secret on this. Right. Yeah. Well, he got he got the timing, and he had uh, he had called my folks, and so they had started down, but they didn't get down there in time to watch us land. But it was really something to to oh, see yeah. them and to get a chance to visit with them. Huh. So that was really uh, we got um, a month of leave. And I was engaged to a girl living in uh, Pueblo, and we came, I came back to visit her. And I stopped back on the, uh, went back out to visit my folks and spent a couple of weeks with them. And then we went down to Camp Pendleton on about the 20th of January in 1952. And we were there in a casual company for a while. And then a number of us were, they were activating the 9th Marine Regiment. And it was 3rd Marine Division. And a lot of us they put in the 9th Marines. I think it was assigned to A Company, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. But I was only in there four or five days, and they decided that they would release the reservists because they were getting enough, well, they were getting draftees and stuff in, as well as enlistees. And so on April the 13th, it was six, 18 months and a day after I'd been recalled. I was released to uh, to civilian life, but wow. I was still in the inactive reserves. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and I know I sweat out the uh, Vietnam early because the, the French had tried to get us to go in. Uh, Eisenhower wouldn't do it, and I'm saying thank you <laughs> because I was still I was afraid that I'd be recalled. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So. Um, that was pretty much the experience I had. Well, I'd like to go back and, and ask go you ahead. some questions about uh, this we'll time. Right Can you talk about, uh, particularly, I imagine when you guys were going over ridges and down valleys and over ridges, that it uh, obviously the most dangerous part was when you guys were crossing over the, down in the valleys. And up and up the, And back up the hill. Yeah. Uh, yes. How do you, I'm, I'm trying to grasp this uh, in general, uh, going into battle, in particular going down through those valleys, Particularly, you know, never been in battle before, and pretty much everybody that's going to watch this video has never been in battle before. What's it, what are you thinking? What's it like when you you know you're going into harm's way? You're heading into harm's way. You you just kind of suck it up and do it. You don't really have any choice in the matter. Yeah, you're scared. There's no question about that. Now the fact of the matter is that most of the hills we went up, we didn't get any combat from. Some we did. Uh, some we knew ahead of time that we were going to get it, some we didn't. So you just kind of suck it up and do what you have to do. I guess that's part of being a Marine. Yeah. And I presume the uh, Army infantry had to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But we, we stayed pretty much out of the, uh, out of the valleys um, and were up on the ridges as much as we could because, you know, the person who holds the high ground has the advantage. And that was the maxim that we went by. And so we were up in the hills all the time. We weren't down. I can remember that last ridge line that we were on, it took us three or four hours to climb up to that ridge line. Uh, we had South Korean laborers bring our food up because we didn't have the manpower. 
and it took them, I think they said six hours, carrying the food on their backs to come up that ridge line. I, I've got a picture here that I'll show you that will give you a, a pretty good idea of what it was like, but it was, it was hard. Hmm. It was hard. And what about the back end of this? Uh, after a major battle and, and, uh, and you guys are either pulled back or things settle down and, and you're laying in your foxhole or maybe something a little bit nicer and you've got time to think, uh, how do you decompress or what goes through your mind at that point? Uh, um, when I left this country, one of my family, and I don't remember who it was now, gave me a New Testament with Psalms in it. And they had pointed out that the 23rd Psalm might be, I might find it particularly helpful. And I can remember one of the first things we did when we got back in reserve, I would break that out and read the 23rd Psalm. And I'd come to that point where it says, yea, to the valley of the shadow of death. And I'm thinking, you know, I've just come from there. In a couple of days, I'm gonna go back there. But that gave me, you know, some hope. But we were all, all the same thing, and we were all in the same boat, and we supported each other. And you know what they say is when you get in a firefight, it's not the country you're fighting for. It's your, your buddies. And that is so true. That is so true. And we knew that. And that gave us the, uh, that gave us the comfort that we needed. Well, a <clears throat> along those lines, once again, never experiencing anything worse than seeing a, a buddy break his arm. Mm -hmm. Here you're seeing people injured and killed. Mm -hmm. How do, you, how do you deal with that and keep going? Uh, you just, I guess you say, thank goodness it wasn't me. And now we didn't have too many people killed. We had a few, we had a lot of wounded. And you know, <laughs> you lucky dog, you're gonna be out of here for a while if you're wounded, you know. <laughs> but you just, you learn to live with it. You know, again, what choice do you have? You don't have any choice. You have to do it, and you just you just did it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's about all I can that's about all I can yeah. say. Yeah. Now, when I got back here, I didn't talk about this to anybody. Um, my first wife, up to the time she died, had no idea what we'd went through. Elaine has been we've been married 26 years and she's been at a number of my reunions. And when we get to the reunion, we talked through and we fought every battle that we were in. So she knows pretty much what happened. My first wife had no clue because mm. we didn't talk about it. And the World War II guys wouldn't either. Yeah, yeah. I had one of my uncles was in World War II. He was in the 77th Infantry Division. He wouldn't talk about it. And I understand, yeah. I understood that. Well, we know now today, more recently with the diagnosis of PD, uh, SD, yeah. Do you think you went through any of that? And how was that, I guess, going back to an earlier question, when I asked about the transition from civilian to military mm -hmm. life, what was that transition like for going from military to back to civilian life, particularly after all you'd been through? And, and how was that then and how is it now, I guess? Um, the PSD here, you know, we didn't have that when right. I was there, but we had an awful lot of people drinking too much. Now that probably was the way they handled it. I was very fortunate I didn't have it. And you know, what you did was you just clammed up. Now, I had been out of the service, I got out in the middle of April. The first of June, I got really pretty sick. And I went to my doctor and I said, yeah, I probably got the flu. And he looked at me and said, no. He said, I think you've got malaria. He said, well, we had, we took pills for it. Yeah, but he said, you've been off the pill. And he said, we had, he said, I want you to go into the, to the Veterans Administration Hospital. We had one about 10 miles away. And so my mother took me in there. And I can remember the doctor came out. Well, how do you know you got malaria? Well, my doctor told me, how does he know? And he was on, he was a major. And here I'd been a sergeant. I said, if, finally I got aggravated. I said, if you don't believe I'm sick, not sick, you put a thermometer in my mouth. He stuck a thermometer in my mouth, pulled it out and told the nurse, said, go get a wheelchair and wheel him back <laughs> into the door. <laughs> so the next morning, my bedclothes were all wet, you know, and everything from 
perspiration. And I asked the nurse, I, I said, boy, my bed clothes wet. Well, I said, that's the second set you've had on. We change you in the middle of the night. I said, well, do I have malaria? And said, yeah, you got it. And the doctor came in and said, well, fortunately, it's not as severe a type of malaria as those guys in World War II got in the South Pacific. But it is malaria. Uh, they kept me there about two weeks. And he released me and he said, now, you're more than welcome to come back here. There's no question but what a service incurred. However, there isn't anything we can do for you except give you these chloroquine pills. And we'll give you all you want. And when you run out, come back and get some more. And he didn't say if you run out. He said when you run out. <laughs> get some more. Well, I had four attacks about a month apart that summer and fall. And um, I uh, took the chloroquine. I didn't go back in. And they would last about a week. Fortunately, it missed the, uh, I went to college and played football. And it missed the, uh, it missed me there. The last attack I had was on a Thanksgiving. And I haven't had anything since then. Is that right? But they still don't take my blood because of the, of the malaria that's mm -hmm. been in there. So, you know, you just deal with things like that. You don't worry about it. I've got this hanging over my, over the television. I brought it out about 10 years ago because the problem I have here is deteriorating. And at some point, I'm not going to be able to get out of this chair. But I hung that up to help me not feel sorry for myself, to think about how fortunate I was to have lived 60 years beyond that day, because some people didn't. And we'll film this and you can and talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, now, you had mentioned earlier uh, when, when you were knocked down on the trail there, did, did that wound amount to anything? Did that, or whatever no. came of that was... No, okay. Uh, I asked my doctor about it when I got home. And he said, you undoubtedly either cracked a rib or a cartilage. And uh, he said it apparently wasn't um, bothering anything. You know, it wasn't in a lung or anything like that. And it just took that time to heal. He said, that's the only thing that would happen to you that would cause the, the thing that you had. But again, you know, like I say, we had so many casualties. It just, I just couldn't, I couldn't go in and do it. Yeah, and and thus uh, it was never documented. So thus, never a, a purple heart for no, anything like no, that. No, yeah. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't bleed. <laughs> wow. Oh. What about uh, you, you talked about? You know, landing in, in the dock and and uh, the secrecy of when you were landing mm -hmm. and such. Uh, so there was a lack. Uh, even during that time, a lack of communications. Mm -hmm. How was communications back and forth from home as far as mail, particularly with you guys out in the middle of nowhere and on the run? And mail, we, we would not get any mail until we were back in reserve. Oh. And we wouldn't send it because we didn't have time to write. Uh, and that's what, one of the reasons I think they tried to get us back, you know, periodically in reserve, every four, five, six days a week, whatever it was. And we would write our parents then and we would get mail from them at that time. It took about, oh, I think seven to 10 days for it to get, you know, snail mail. <laughs> I've, I've got a grandson in uh, Afghanistan right now and I can email him and he gets, he a, gets it right away. What a stark uh, difference, <laughs> yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it took a while for it to get, and packages, you know, it took quite a while. He didn't want to send anything that was wouldn't hold up for like say a week or 10 days so the cakes when they would come would be kind of stale but we didn't care they were good so we ate them but yeah it took it took a while for the mail to get there and i know i can only imagine how concerned my parents and the parents of other people there it must have been oh that was my next question you yeah. said when you got back you never talked about your experiences did your folks ever talk about what they were going through and feeling no, no we didn't ask my dad one day kind of grinned at me and said, well, I know all about what you went through. And I said, oh, well, you've undoubtedly talked to somebody who's been through it, and it's somebody that we knew. And he said, yeah, and he didn't tell me who it was, and I didn't ask him. Hmm. So uh, he had a pretty good idea. I really, uh, you know, I remember the parents in World War II who had uh, sons and daughters in the military, and I knew, I knew some of them, what they were going through, and I knew that my parents were going through the same thing. But we just didn't talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about, and, and being over there and, and by and large isolated, 
uh, how about getting word uh, what was going on in the world, how the war was going, baseball scores, it was just none of No, just, we didn't get much of that. And what we did get was really old. Uh, all we got was rumors that came down through the rumor mill. Some of them were accurate, others weren't. And we really didn't understand what was going on uh, in the rest of the world at all, because, you know, we couldn't. And we were so focused on the problems that we had that we really weren't that concerned about what was going on other places. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. just didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Well, let's move ahead then and do your post four years. Uh, you uh, got out of the Marines. Sounds like you went off to college. Uh, take your yep. story from there then. Okay. I managed to play uh, football. I worked uh, at an athletic job. You know, this is an a NAIA school. It wasn't big time. And um, my two oldest children were born before I got out of college. Uh, my senior year, the GI Bill wasn't giving us enough money to live on. So mm. we got a new coach in and I told the coach, I said, I'm sorry. You know, I'd let her deal with I said, I just can't do it. I, my family comes first. And I'd gotten another job that I worked three or four hours a day at and just didn't have time to do my school. But I was majoring in social studies and um, I graduated in four years. Um, I got a job in a small high school in the eastern part of Washington State. I was history and English teacher, and I coached some football, and I was assistant basketball and baseball coach. Actually, I started out a year or two as an assistant football coach before I became the head coach. It was a small high school. We had maybe 115 or 20 students in it. I really, I guess I was just barely qualified to teach English in Washington State. And the superintendent said, we've had nothing but older ladies teaching English. I want to put a new perspective on the English. So I taught freshman English, sophomore English, and junior English, as well as uh, American history and civics, and I had a study hall. So I didn't really have a planning period. And then I was coaching three sports a day. So my days were full, but they were peaceful. I was there four years, and then we moved back to Colorado because my first one was folks were back here. And I got a job as principal at Berthoud High School. I'd gone back and got my master's degree in administration. I was principal at the junior senior high school. And I spent 29 years in this district. Wow. My first wife passed away. We had four children. Elaine and I were married, which has been a blessing to me. Uh, she had four children. I had four children. We have 17 grandchildren, wow. five great grandchildren, another one on the way. <laughs> so, and her family just has been great to me. They really have. So we've, uh, <clears throat> I uh, retired in 1989. I worked, I drove um, courier service for medical lab for about oh, a year and a half. I worked part time as a janitor for Laramie County for five and a half years. We go down where you get your license plates down here. I cleaned the, that floor, and the, they had the court room was in there and I cleaned that. I had to be at work at quarter six in the morning, left at quarter ten in the uh, in the uh, morning. So I worked about five and a half years at that. And when I got to be 65, I said, you know, I've had enough. <laughs> and Elaine, Elaine went ahead and worked, and she's been retired about 11 years now, and I've been retired 21 years from the school. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, from uh, from everything. <laughs> no, actually, I've been 21 years from the school district. So it's been a good life. Yeah, yeah. I can't complain at all about it. Uh, you'd mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you and Elaine going back to reunions. So over the years, you've gone to reunions, kept in touch with the guys you yes, served with. Yes, we had. Uh, we've been to I think six reunions, and it was just really good because we'd been some places we hadn't been before. Elaine hadn't been in San Diego, and we were down in San Diego, and she had a cousin that she was very good friends with who was living there. So they got a chance to visit. We were up in Seattle, and uh, we got a chance to visit there. We were in Las Vegas, and uh, a visit there. Then we were in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'd never been there. We got to go to the Grand Ole Opry, and then we were in uh, New Orleans, and we got to visit the sites in New Orleans. We were in Boston, and we had our dinner out at the uh, Kennedy Library. Uh, one of our platoon leaders, in fact, he was a platoon leader of the platoon that we were attached to, 
was a junior member of the Democratic Party, but he got the job as curator of the Kennedy Museum. Now, he had retired by this time, but of course he still had. So it was just, just a beautiful, beautiful site. And we drove from there and visited some of Elaine's friends up in, uh, they had a summer home up on the beach in Searsport, Maine. And we visited there and we drove back through Maine and Vermont and, and uh, New Hampshire. And it's, you know, just beautiful. Yeah. Now there are a lot of places this in this country I haven't been, but I've been pretty blessed to be the places that I have been. Yeah. And I've just been really pleased with it. Yeah. Yeah, and like you said, you've kept in touch with buddies yes. as well. Uh, um, one of our guys that I was particularly in touch with was um, German. Well, he was American. He was born in this country in 1930, but his parents were German. Now, being born in this country made him a citizen. But jobs were hard to get. In 1932 or three, they moved back to Germany. He was raised in Germany. He was a member of the Hitler Youth Movement. Um, he missed the last draft by, uh, he said, about three months. Uh, he said there were half a dozen real good friends. He said the other five guys got in the draft and said they were all killed. He'd lost a finger, he said, to a Russian hand grenade. Uh, he came, his sister married an American, and they lived in State College, Pennsylvania. And his dad encouraged him to go with them since he was an American citizen. So he came in 1948 and 1950, joined the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was probably the best infantryman I have ever been with. Whenever we were minus a platoon leader, even as a corporal and sergeant, he was the platoon leader. He's living now out in Chinookum, Washington. Uh, we've been out, Lane and I have been out to visit him two or three times, he and his wife. And um, he stayed in the Marine Corps. He retired as a captain. He did two tours in Vietnam. Uh, he came back and um, well, he, he went to school and became an elementary school teacher and then retired and he's still there. In fact, I called him, it was about a week ago and visited with him on the telephone. Hmm. Uh, the guy that I had lined up against in, on the football team that I told you about yeah, earlier, yeah. He, uh, he lost leg in March of, uh, of 51. Uh, he worked for the Oregon de Rehab Department and uh, he's living, I think, in state in Oregon. Uh, we've exchanged emails, telephone calls. Uh, we've actually not visited each other. I think it's been about 10 years since I visited him. And uh, of course, he's having some heart problems now along with his leg and I'm having problems. And so we're probably not gonna get a chance to see each other. Yeah. But we're, we're real good, real good friends. Those are pr probably the two guys I've stayed the closest with. Mm -hmm. um, some of the guys that I was close to have died now. And uh, of course, you know, it's, we're getting to that age. So I have felt really pretty, pretty fortunate yeah. to have those two guys that, and we're good friends and there's no problem in calling them anytime. Wow, wow. You had mentioned earlier that you've got a grandson in Afghanistan. Yes. How is that? I mean, I, I think any grandparent's going to worry to begin with. Oh, yeah. But it, you know, you know what you've been through. How does that play on, on your thought? Well, I, he fortunately is not an infantryman. And uh, he's responsible for computers. Hey, they've got computers now down to platoon level. I just can't, can't believe that. But he's responsible for maintaining the... Uh, the um, well, whatever you call it, the, the way to get the, the pictures and stuff from headquarters out, he's responsible for maintaining that. So he doesn't face every day what I did, but mm -hmm. Afghanistan's a different war mm -hmm. and you never know for right. sure. And uh, his mother lives here in town and she's got a double dosage now. Her husband worked for Larimer County was a landscaper and got laid off last December. He got a job last Wednesday with a company called AMEC, A-M-E-C. He's going to Kabul, Afghanistan. And so she's going to have both a husband and a son. Oh boy. Now the son will be coming back, and she said either the middle of December or the middle of January. But it's difficult. He's a good son-in-law, and I really 
appreciate him. But you know, you pray every day that he's going to be okay. Yeah. And that's all you can do. Yeah. 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 Well, Bruce, we'll start to wind down this interview. Okay. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or any other stories that have kind of floated to the top as we've been talking here? That, so hopefully we've, We'll round out your story as best we can, or do you think we've done a good job of it? Uh, no, I think we've probably pretty well covered everything that uh, in my story. I, I, there's not been anything left out that I wanted to talk about. Okay, okay. Obviously, I left out some things I didn't want to talk oh, about. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Well, the, the last question I always like to ask with these interviews is, how do you think that experience changed or affected your life, or did it? Or was it just simply a chapter you went through? Well. I think it's both. It was a chapter I went through, but, you know, I learned a lesson. Now, my dad taught us that too, but I really learned it in spades this time. You don't quit. You don't give up. You do what you have to do, and you do it as best you can. Now, being a school administrator is not an easy job, and I had my problems there, but I hung in there, and I did what I had to do, and actually, most of the people I got along real well with. But, you know, you can't please everybody. <laughs> and so occasionally there would be somebody who was in a position of authority that I didn't please. But that's okay. I hung with it, and I think that experience gave me the courage to, uh, to do that. And I wasn't going to quit. If they wanted to fire me, they could. But there was no way they were going to run me off. <laughs> and I think probably that's the thing that I learned one of the things, then the second thing I learned was here, I'm so fortunate for having survived that, that I don't feel sorry for myself now at all. I have this disease, I'm living with it, I live day by day, I do what I can each day, and I don't worry about tomorrow. Because when tomorrow comes, I'll find a way, we'll find a way to handle tomorrow. And one of the reasons is because of that experience that I had in Korea. <clears throat> well, Bruce, I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, that's fine. I, I appreciate that. <laughs>
So, um, uh, but that's really what that's about. I can't say any more about it. Those were three prisoners that we took on that assault. Um, I'm not sure whether we had any more or not. You know, we're so focused on what's right ahead of us, or maybe just a little bit to the left or right, we don't really see what's going on across the rest of the perimeter. But those are three prisoners that we took. Now, they look pretty young, but, you know, we were all young, too. Absolutely. I was only 19. Yeah, absolutely. So I have no idea what their ages were. Now we've taken the hill and what we're doing is we're waiting in case they have a mount a counter attack. I'm the one on the right. Um, fortunately we didn't get a counter attack but at that stage you know we weren't sure so we had to be ready for it and that's what that picture is about. Yeah, the 5th Marine Regiment was responsible for taking the hill line to the uh, to the right side of the picture there. Uh, the hills there were, I think the last one we were on there was, was 610. Now that's meters. Uh, now it seems to be higher than that, but you start out almost from sea level when you climb up there. And uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty rough, um, both the climbing and the fighting that went on there. Um, we had quite a few casualties there. We were uh, supporting the North Korean uh, uh, Marine Regiment. South Korean? South Korean, I'm sorry. South Korean Marine Regiment. They were assaulting a hill mass in front of us. And they had us dug in right behind them in case the communists tried to flank them. And uh, that's our machine gun position there. And I'm standing there with one of our ammo carriers. I'm the one on the left. Mm. And, you know, as you can see, I'm... Not looking too great. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, you, you supported the South Korean uh, yes. uh, Marines there. This being a multinational conflict, did you ever deal any uh, dealings with any of the other nationalities, the Greeks, the Turks, the English? Uh, uh, we really didn't, but in late in April of 1951, our bacon was saved by the, the British troops who were to the west of us. And you'd have to go back and read a history of the uh, of the war to understand. But if they had not held out the way they did, we could have been encircled where we were. But they hung in there and held out, and so we were able to uh, we were able to make it out. But that was the only we didn't really have any contact. Uh, I think maybe we relieved a French battalion about the first of September by what they called the punch bowl but we didn't really have any contact with them at all. We're back in reserve in the summer of, uh, of 1951, and I'm not sure just exactly when, but I'm sitting there right next to the uh, um, sleeping hole and shelter half that I have there. We didn't sleep on any beds or anything for it was over 11 months. We slept on the ground. Now that's another picture of me similar to the one that was taken before. I'm uh, standing beside the uh, foxhole, well it really wasn't a foxhole, it was a sleeping hole that I had dug and put a, a tent over to keep the rain out. And uh, we were in reserve there in the summer of 1951. Very good.